Well, uh, as, as announced, my name is Johan Nilsson and this is my colleague Sara Eriksson. Hi. Uh, we're with United Minds. It's a firm based in Stockholm. Uh, we do mainly consumer analysis of different kinds. And uh, we're really here to talk to you from a generalist's perspective. We're not, well, at least I'm not tech people. <laughs> Sara, she's better at that stuff than I am. But uh, we are interested in technology and health and how they intersect around consumers. So, and uh, hi, I'm Sarah, as you once said. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, health from a consumer perspective, more than a tech perspective, even though we talk about these different kinds of tech trends that we see today. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk very briefly about the quantified self-movement, because I'm sure you all know about it. You know what self-tracking is. Uh, it's about measuring different aspects of your life, like food consumption, training, performance, mood, uh, sleep, and other kinds of data, kinds of me medical data as well, like blood oxygen levels and uh, heart rate and other stuff. Uh, what's interesting is that it's not only tech junkies or fitness freaks who use these uh, self-tracking methods anymore. It's, uh, it's me and you. And okay, maybe you are a fitness freak or tech junkies, I don't know. But um, everyday people. And, uh, you know, uh, you've seen this uh, different kinds of app before, Runkeeper, Sleep Cycle and Lumosity. Um, and the, they all use different kinds of uh, game mechanics, um, like tasks or quests, and uh, then rewards in form of, you know, sharing with your friends that you've done this and that. And also you get these uh, shards uh, that shows your progress over time. Um, and I listened to Hua's presentation earlier uh, when he showed uh, you know, you, uh, a slide where he had, had um, collected the data from different sources and different types of apps like Sleep Cycle and uh, Viari and other, other apps uh, to compare these different kinds of data with each other and also compare your data with uh, your friends or your colleagues. Uh, but what's interesting is that <laughs> when I Google, I'm not a technological freak. I, I don't know any, everything about um, internet and what to do. Uh, so anyway, when I googled uh, extract data from sleep cycle, I got to this uh, Quora website. Quora site, you know, you all know about it. Uh, and to a question. And the answer was, um, you need to download a program um, and then connect your iPhone to your computer, uh, locate a folder called documents, and then a file called self event log.sqlite. And then you need to download another program that can manage this file. And uh, old people cannot do this. They don't know, everyday people um, are not comfortable with uh, doing these kinds of, of things. But as we will show you later, they are interested in analyzing their data in more complex ways than just seeing you know, a graph. Uh, or, uh, um, or improvement in, in, a, in a chart. So, um, another aspect that's very interesting is that it's with all these new kind of sensors, you can uh, track your data even more easily. Uh, you know, you all know Nike plus Fuel Band, I guess I saw you had one. <laughs> Could we have a show of hands? How many people have those? Yeah. One, two, three. And there's also, um, shame on you. Other kinds Should of wristbands they can use, and also uh, this is a live core, and it, which is basically is an iPhone case with electrodes. They so can measure your heart rate and your ECG very easily. And with all these data being stored, um, you know, you want to, <laughs> we would like to aggregate it and to see the patterns and analyze it and do something with it, instead of just looking at your own data. You want to compare your data with, with friends or others. So, uh, to improve my health, I want to uh, I want to compare my health with uh, compare my sleep patterns or uh, or my training or uh, um, diets with uh, with other persons um, to get a fuller picture of uh, what I should do to improve it. And uh, one website, as I think you've seen, is patients like me. And uh, they manage to, uh, their, <laughs> their goal is to uh, collect 
large amount of data, uh, health data from users. So uh, the users then can uh, try out uh, different kinds of treatments, uh, and you can aggregate the data and see what works and what, wor what doesn't work. So, and then Johan is going to talk a little more about the social aspects of data yes. sharing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, because uh, obviously there are numerous ways of collecting data. Now, I think most of us here are probably drawn by that possibility. Uh, and personally, what I find really interesting is what these devices collecting all this information will do to us socially, what kind of uh, uses we'll find for this information about ourselves. So, uh, essentially, what happens to us and what do we choose to do when we know more? Uh, this is one example of many that has improved the way we can collect information about our bodies. It's uh, called the Minion. It's, it's a little device that you connect to your PC, essentially allowing you to sequence your own genome from a home PC. Uh, it's one example of many, but the important thing is that most people will be able to find an affordable means of knowing quite a lot about their futures, what will actually happen to them in 20 or 30 years' time, and things that they might be able to change, given a few life factors. The interesting thing is what it does, though. Uh, how many people recognize this guy? Show of hands. That's very good. His name is actually there as well. So this <laughs> is Muhammad Ali. Uh, a famous fighter who's currently fighting uh, Parkinson's. Uh, what struck me, apart from the powerful imagery, is the fact that he featured on 23andMe's website. I'm not sure how many people in here are familiar with 23andMe, but it's an American site for it's genome sequencing. You can find out about your, uh, well, essentially where you came from, uh, of, of specific interest to a lot of Americans. Uh, you can find out whether or not you have any risk for specific hereditary disease, and Parkinson's being one of them. So, in this case, you've uh, this kind of odd situation where people used to be able to join these groups for, uh, say, disease societies or uh, medical societies where you'd get support for, um, say, a treatment for Parkinson's or better, better hospital rules for cancer, things like that but it becomes something that's of interest to you because you know of the risk of actually contracting this later on. So essentially you're in this situation where you're not really interested in only what you have at the moment, but you can relate to people because of shared risks for the future. And that got me to think about this guy who's, I, th I think he is less well known than the guy before. It's Paul Rabinov, he's an American uh, sociologist who's coined the term biosociology, which I think is really good to think with in this case. Uh, essentially, it means that he, he claims that facts about our bodies forms a new way to, to socialize with others and to form new groups. So, essentially, people finding a, a, a diagnosis society, they come together for help or to change society in some other way, or maybe to, just to change the outcome of their disease. But uh, what you can do is, obviously, you can do this by, by forming societies for people who have a, the same kind of future problems or possible problems, something in the future. Wallaho is an example of what people do socially with their data now. So you, you join because you need medical attention. You connect with uh, your medical practitioner, other carers and loved ones. You exchange information, uh, what to eat, how to take medicines. You might give feedback to your doctor. But what you, what you don't really do is that you don't... You mightn't be very proactive. This might very well only draw in people who are already suffering from something, who, people who already have a diagnosis. I thought this was really interesting. This is Raymond McCauley. He's an American biotechnician who used one of those 20, 23andMe services to sequence parts of his own DNA, and then I think he did all of it eventually. The important thing is that he found out that he had a hereditary, or he had yeah, a hereditary increased risk of contracting this specific uh, progressive blindness, uh, which might make anyone really unhappy, but what he did was that he found a startup with a bunch of other people connecting to others with this specific predisposition to, to try to work out new ways of, 
of not getting this at some point in the future. So you've, you've not only people who are coming together around medical data, but they're really connecting about things that haven't really happened yet. Uh, I think an interesting part of this is the fact that people will take medical data in new ways. It's important that, that you can allow people to say download information or share it not only to a circle of friends via Facebook or a certain, a certain GP that you've already had contact with. You need to be able to, to download information to, to share it to someone that the developer hasn't really thought about yet. Um, this is all very abstract, so we're going to take a step back, <laughs> a wee step down and talk about how Stockholmers feel about using medical information at the moment, because we, we asked a bunch of them. Yeah, um, we surveyed uh, Stockholmers who own a smartphone. Uh, a few questions about uh, health and uh, their smartphone, and how uh, large impact the smartphone plays on uh, in their health. So, uh, how would you rate your phone's impact on your health today? Not surprisingly, the people don't think that um, the smartphone plays a major role in their health today, but interesting enough is that 28% say that it, plays, it has a minor impact on their health. And even interesting is that a lot of people are actually interested in using their phone more, uh, managing and uh, improving their health. And then we asked about specific apps or types of apps. And uh, these two are the ones that are most interesting to Stockholmers to download and use. And it's not surprising because you know, these are things, uh, jogging, step counting, uh, problem solving, brain tra training. These are things that you do already. You know, uh, the concept is clear, it's familiar, you know the benefits, uh, you've done it in school for all your life. But if we look at uh, more medical types of apps like self-diagnosis or uh, a reminder to take your medicines or birth control pills, the interest is still there, but it's a little bit less. It shows you really need to um, show the users the benefits of using these kinds of apps. Yes, and then we, we did ask people, considering the fact that some of them might have already collected some sort of data collected to their health on their smartphones, we just <laughs> simply asked them what they'd, what they'd be interested in doing with it. It's not very surprising. Most people want to have a look at it themselves. Uh, but it would only make sense. But then again, there's a good, so, a good quarter of people who are actually interested in uh, sharing it with others, usually just showing it to a friend. But it could also mean using Facebook or another social media, or it's uh, going to a specific forum where other people sharing the same problem gather. Uh, in either case, it's really important to accommodate for both these groups when you when you deal with the information that's actually connected, collected by an app, uh, because that means that you might be able to connect with those that have very little interest already, those who just maybe don't really realize that they collect health data or they don't really want to do anything with it anyways. And th they're an important group to win over. Uh, and then we specifically checked for the interest in sharing data connected or collected on your phone with medical practitioners. Most people were surprisingly positive to this, probably because they, they trust their GPs. It's probably not more, more of a hard thing to understand than that. But it is, it is important that with this group you realize that not only most you, do you have to be able to download the information in a format that's easier to handle than using tons and tons of add-on apps, but uh, also the fact that it has to be traceable. If, if you do a test, and you want to show it to a GP, the first thing the GP is going to ask is, where did this come from? How did this test work? So traceability is really important there. Yeah, and this brings us to a few conclusions from what we said. Uh, what's important when you're designing an app for uh, health purposes is first, obviously, transparency. Users need to know what you're going to do with the data uh, or the, what the app is going to, what action is going to perform and also user control, and not only that the user is in total control of their own data and their own 
uh, what's happening with it, but also they need to know it. They need to be sure that uh, nothing that they don't uh, know about happens to it. Yeah, uh, and the shareability part is also important because it, you have to be able to show it to someone unexpected. It's it's pretty simple. It, it, it can't always be preset choices. It is very good to have information that you can actually download and put on a stick somewhere and forget about and just bring it out at some later point. And the traceability is important for that same reason. It's, it's important that you can actually give this to another application or another user or someone else entirely and they'll still realize where the data comes from and what it means. Uh, yeah, so those are a few of our very brief uh, thoughts on what can be done. We're really happy to answer any questions. If any of you would like to contact us, we're there and we'll be here during the rest of the evening. Thank Thanks you very much. Thank you so much.